Happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geopolitical analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. And first up, on Thursday at a political fundraiser in Utah, in the U.S., U.S. President Joe Biden called China a quote. Ticking time bomb, end quote, due to its economic situation, including weak growth, expressing quote, they have got some problems that's not good because when bad folks have problems, they do bad things. End quote, adding that quote, China is in trouble. China is growing at eight percent a year to maintain growth, now close to two percent a year. End quote. While the president is correct in his observation that Chinese growth is indeed slowing, most prominent economists and banks are estimating that China will grow between four to six percent this year, with an official growth rate of around five percent. Though, of course, we note some analysts argue that real growth, that is underlying growth minus the unhealthy drivers, is probably closer to one to two percent. U.S. commentators observe that Biden's remarks are reminiscent of comments that he made back at another rally in June, when he referred to Xi Jinping as a dictator. Comments which were soon after walked back, and which Beijing called a provocation at the time. U.S. relations are at their worst point since their formal establishment back in 1979. We remember just a day before these comments were made, President Joe Biden signed an executive order prohibiting some new U.S. investment into China when it comes to sensitive technologies like computer chips and AI software. On Friday, yesterday, the U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby told reporters that Biden's China economy comments do not represent a toughening of rhetoric on China, and that the remarks were consistent with U.S. criticisms of Beijing to date. Explaining, quote, the president is referring to the domestic challenges that China has at home, and some of those are on the economic front, and some of those are on the social and cultural front. End quote. Of course, as regular viewers know too well, the Chinese economy is indeed currently in a very difficult place. However, the diagnosis is perhaps a bit more nuanced than the U.S. president's explanation. The massive Chinese economy is going through a process of painful structural transition, with policymakers facing tough, interconnected systemic challenges to navigate. The most prominent of which being the local fiscal situation, the wider property crisis, an aging workforce, climbing debt levels, and falling productivity. Now, most of these challenges are the direct result of one thing: China's growth model. The model which served it so well for many years has been obsolete for about a decade or so, and needs to change to a new one, which will reconcile the imbalances within the economy. This transition is always difficult, not only presenting economic disruptions, but Political challenges too, as the winners of the old growth model are now powerful vested interests who have deep personal incentives to advocate the maintenance of the status quo. These are deeply interesting times for China, of course, and we will continue to follow developments as they happen here, day by day, week by week, month by month. And I hope that you will all continue to follow along. On the ride. If you're enjoying today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit the like button. Liking, sharing, and subscribing are all huge helps for the channel. And for anyone who can go the extra mile, Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. Now, speaking of China's economy, next up, let's move through several salient economic and business-related developments. Yesterday, Friday, the People's Bank of China, China's central bank, published new official numbers on financing in the banking system. And the numbers are not positive. According to the official data, in July, Chinese banks extended the smallest amount of monthly loans since 2009, the global financial crisis, with new loans reaching 345.9 billion yuan, just shy of 50 billion U.S. dollars, in July, less than half of the 780 billion yuan that economists forecast in a Bloomberg survey. Quote: It is a big disappointment. Proving the fragile status of the recovery in China. End quote. Household loans, a proxy for mortgages, contracted by 67.2 billion yuan in July, a sign that households continue to make early prepayment of mortgages. 
Quote, economic fundamentals are not great, particularly in the property sector. Household credit numbers are very weak, and businesses also do not seem to have a strong motive to borrow. End quote. This is yet another sign of weak demand and prolonged deflationary pressure. Quote, it is hard to see credit growth turning around. Deflationary risk will remain in place going forward. End quote. The offshore yuan extended a decline shortly after the data was published, dropping as much as 0.2% to 7.255 per dollar. The official numbers also show that total social financing, a euphemism Beijing uses for aggregate debt, was down in July, rising by only 500 billion RMB, the lowest monthly increase in years. Quote, this was way below expectations. To give a sense of just how small that increase is, the average monthly increase for the first seven months of this year, 3.2 trillion yuan. The decline was led by an 89% month-on-month fall in bank loans, which accounted for nearly two-thirds of the total. The good news is that the growth in debt is moderating, at least it did last month. The bad news is that it is clearer than ever how overly dependent the Chinese economy is on surging debt. Year-to-date total social financing has increased by an amount equal to roughly 32% of the period's GDP. End quote. Next up is Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei Technologies Co. back from the dead, or at least back from life support. According to analyst calculations on a recent filing, Huawei sales rose for a third straight quarter driven by cloud services and smartphone businesses mitigating the fallout from U.S. sanctions, which cut the supply of key components and software, including 5G chips and Alphabet Inc.'s Android operating system. In Q2, revenue rose 4.8% to 178.8 billion yuan, 24.7 billion U.S. dollars. Net income also trebled. Huawei and Apple Inc. were the only two major brands to record growth in China smartphone shipments in the second quarter. In a statement from Huawei yesterday, the company explains that the turnaround comes down to, quote, improvements in operational efficiency, sales strategy, and product mix, end quote. It is clear that Huawei has refocused on the domestic market and emerging businesses for profit. Chief Financial Officer Meng Wenzhou of Canadian and Two Michaels fame, or infamy, depending on one's view, also expressed yesterday, quote, Our digital power and cloud businesses both experienced strong growth, and our components for intelligent connected vehicles continued to gain competitiveness, end quote. Next up, we have one more development to cover. In yesterday's video, we did a deep dive into the Chinese developer, Country Garden Holdings Limited, why it's an important player to follow, and why some are concerned that it could end up being an Evergrande 2.0. We have a few more developments related to the company from the last 24 hours, so we will look at these to supplement yesterday's video. If you have not seen yesterday's video and you are interested in the housing crisis generally and Country Garden specifically, I would highly recommend watching this uh, or that video first and then touching on what we're going to cover now. After missing coupon payments on two offshore bonds on Monday, the massive Chinese developer said on Thursday, two days ago, that it expects a net loss in the first half of 2023 to reach over 45 billion RMB, 6.2 billion US dollars or more. Analysts with Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin wrote yesterday, quote, If the property giant fails to repay its bonds on time, the risk is likely to spread to other types of debt, and the sheer size of its liabilities means that the impact on the industry will be huge. Here ends the quote. An executive at a Chinese bond investment company speaking to the outlet expressed that the losses will be borne not only by financial institutions, but also Country Garden suppliers and customers, and that the bond default by Country Garden will lead to a further collapse of confidence. Adding, quote, if no external force comes to its rescue and Country Garden falls apart, other private developers will collapse one by one. And the last bit of market confidence will be worn away, end quote. Remember that this is being reported by a prominent domestic financial outlet within China itself. 
The market shares this pessimism too. In early trading in Hong Kong yesterday, China Garden's stock fell as much as 14.4% to 11 US cents, falling below one Hong Kong dollar for the first time ever. The once mighty developer has fallen about 70% from a January peak, the worst performer on the Hang Seng Index during this period. The company's market value has thus been reduced to 3.3 billion US dollars from an all-time high of around 50 billion US dollars back in 2018. US financial media outlet Bloomberg reports that a gauge for Chinese developers fell as much as 2.9% on Friday, with Country Garden being the worst performer. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Have a wonderful Saturday, have a great weekend, and I will see you all back here for more China Update on Monday.